want to say good morning. Well, it's a Sunday morning. You may not be watching it this on Sunday morning. Oh, there's our first video. But um, we're starting off with uh, just whoever's present. Um, I'm actually just welcoming in. Um, I was going to go ahead and get started. Uh, people, are, I think, are running a little bit behind because of things that were going on at church. But uh, our lesson today is going to be called Daniel's Friends Refuse to Bow. And we're going to be reading Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, and then skip down to verse 8 to 18. Let's go to God in prayer. Most holy and gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for those present. We thank you for those that are to come. We thank you for those that will uh, partake in this online. We ask, Father, that you would add a blessing to this study, to this lesson. Use me as a mouthpiece. And in the format that you're having me to do, uh, ask for that you would bless the mouths of those who would participate. Guide our hearts, our minds, as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth, even in this lesson this day. Father, it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray all things. Amen. <coughs> okay, it's a smaller audience to, to start, and hopefully people are just running behind. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get started to, to not belabor those that, uh, those that came at, uh, on time or at a decent time. So before we get into this lesson, uh, we're... Just give it just a small snippet of background. This is a little bit of a continuation from what uh, Minister Scott taught last week um, about how Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon invaded Judah, took back all of Judah captive, except for a few evil men that they left behind. Um, but they took them all captive, and then he chose out the best of the best, uh, those who seemed to be the wisest, and then he put them into service for himself. And that, that, that'll that come into to play a little bit as we learn about, as we go through this story. Um, in the lesson that Minister Scott taught last week, we learned about, it's it mostly about Daniel, um, but he mentioned his his three friends, and in this story, it's going to be focused upon Daniel's three friends, who were in the Israel, uh, in the Hebrew name, sorry, uh, was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, when they brought them over, uh, I believe it was even touched on last week about how we were trying to assimilate to them to Babylonian culture. The first one of the first things they did was change their name, and so Hananiah was given the name of Shadrach. Now this is this is uh, important because each name meant something. So Hananiah was Jah has favored, and now they they had changed it to command of Aku. Aku was a Babylonian deity, uh, which was considered the moon god. So he's changing it for. Basically, we don't want any reference to your God. We want you to reference to our God. So, you know, now we're not worried about Jah or the shortened version of Yahweh, if you will, uh, has favor. We want you to be under the command of Aku. And then Mishael, he gave the name of Meshach, which is which was changed from who is what God is, and they change it to guest of a king. So they, they want to take away, like, don't worry about being like God. We want you to be... We want you to look to the king and, and consider yourself a guest of the king. And Azariah, they gave the name of Abednego, which is changing from Jah has helped or, or God has helped to now you're a servant of Nebo. Nebo. Uh, now, this was a god. This is another Babylonian deity. It's one of two major deities that they, that they have. We'll mention the other one in just a moment. But Nebo, N-E-B-O was a god, lowercase g, a god of learning, 
science, wisdom, and scribes. So now you can kind of start to understand why he, why in the first chapter he was looking for people who were very educated because they want, he wanted them to basically serve his God. Um, so that's a little bit what we're coming into now. Uh, all of these people were in, they they were enslaved after 605 BC, after the invasion of Judah, and he learns of Nebuchadnezzar. Then learns of of these three individuals' devotion to God, and that's where we'll pick up this story. It's it's about 18 years after they've been in captivity. That's the estimated time um, of when this all took place. So so they went from very young men to now they're a little bit more mature men at this point in time. So thank you to, for all those who joined. I went ahead and got got started about five after. So we're just we're just getting into it. Now the aim of the lesson the. The first is the fact is to acknowledge that the world stands in opposition to God. The principle that we want to pick up is to stress that God's people are called to stand for him. And the application we hope to take away is to resolve to willingly accept hostility from the world because we stand for Jesus. And the golden text will be Daniel chapter 3 verse 17 where it says, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. We'll get into all that a bit later. Okay, so the I'm going to go ahead and read the first verse. Uh, the In the book, the first section is called The Golden Idol, and we're just reading Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. And this is King James Version. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the, pro in the province of Babylon. So we see immediately an imposing figure. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he had set up this golden image. We don't know exactly what this image was. Um, there's some speculation that it might have been of himself. Uh, I had, I've had i mentioned already one guy that they served. They, they served two major ones. They served, they served multiple, but it was two major ones. The first one I mentioned already, Nebo, N-E-B-O, being the what they consider the god of wisdom and science and that kind of thing. Uh, the other one that they served was a god called Marduk, M A D. I'm sorry, M A R D U K, and this was considered to be a god of justice, compassion, healing, regeneration, magic, and fairness. So this it says was uh, three scores of cubits, or a score is just twenty, so three times twenty, so so sixty cubits which would equate to about 90 feet or about the, a little bit bigger than an eight-story building, just to, to give you a little bit of reference. And it said it was uh, six cubits wide, which would be about nine feet wide, made of gold. There's also mm. speculation that it could have been this image that he had uh, in the dream. He had a dream, I believe it was, in Chapter 2 of Daniel, which we, we skipped over. But we're not sure exactly what this image was. But regardless, whatever it was, it was this big imposing figure that that was causing some problems because once he built it, the verses that we skipped, that if you go back and read verses 2 through uh, 7, which we're skipping over for this, this lesson, uh, the, the book skips over for this lesson, so we're skipping over it. Um, but if you go back and read verses 2 through 7 in, in Daniel chapter 3, You'll, you'll see that there was some forced worship. They, they said that he gathered all the rulers and, and everyone, and he decreed that worship should be done at the sound of essentially a band. Um, he said the, it says the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, 
all of these are, are different instruments that they would have played back back in that day. And and he also expresses that whoever doesn't come to worship when they hear the band strike up when they hear the music play, they will be placed in a fiery furnace. Now I, I have a few questions that I I'm hoping for some some crowd participation. Um, with regards to this, and then I'll then I'll open up for if there's any questions or any comments from anyone else on verse one. The first question I have is, what do you think was Nebuchadnezzar's motivation for placing this big golden image? Not necessarily a right or the right answer. It just what what do you think might have been going through his mind as he's building this thing? I think what he was trying to do is um, refocus the dream on himself and uh, not make the dream come true. That's what it seems like to me. Hmm. You know how like when you dream a dream and it's, it's really bad, but you wake up in the middle of it and then you want to finish it to make it out to be good. <laughs> That's what it sounded like to me. <laughs> okay. I can, I can see what, what you're saying. I can see that for sure. Uh, anyone else have any, any other thoughts? What his motivation might have been? Well, a person like him wouldn't have been challenged by anybody in terms of power and authority. So I think um, pride and ego will always get in your way when you're not checked or, or, or challenged or, or there's no balance to the kind of power that you have. So he, like what Carol was saying, he got a dream. He didn't like the interpretation. And so he's going to challenge God, you know, the God that gave him that interpretation in his kind of way, thinking that, well, let's see what you can do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to force people to do things my way. And I'm, I plan to get away with it unless somewhere along the line I'm challenged. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and and I, I was thinking somewhere along that same lines. And, again, I'm not necessarily looking for the right answer. It could be a bunch of different right answers. And, and the, the truth of the matter is we don't know for sure because we weren't, we're not in his mind and we didn't have a chance to talk to him. But – um, I, I'm tending to think of that of that same line that, in, in essence, you don't know. You don't know that you really have, for sure, control over over someone until you can get them to do exactly what you want them to do. And so, while while he had all this power, and I agree, like he didn't really have anybody to stand against him. He was considered at that time a world leader. You know. Um, uh, granted, you know, who knows who, who existed in what is now today considered the United States of America, if, if there were even people over here by then, we don't know. Uh, but still, regardless of, of what was considered the world at that time, he's a world leader, so there's nobody standing in his way. There's nothing that he really, you know, couldn't couldn't enforce. Uh, so, you know, I, I think, I, I agree. I think it's possibly some ego thing. He wanted to make sure, like, okay, you know, hey, watch what I can do. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to make everybody else do this just to show that they're in subjection to me. Now, the follow-up question I have to that, you know, somewhat somewhat related, uh, but, again, just a little bit, I want us to think a little bit. Have leaders today used any of these similar type tactics? Yeah, I think we can point to some people. Uh, we can point to Mao Te Sung or in China when uh, that was primarily a Buddhist nation that he outlawed religion as a communist came to power. One of the things that they do is they don't like religion. They don't of any type. They just think it's like a, a drug for uh, for people's minds. It takes them off of what they're 
purpose in life was to do, and, and you know, in, in that culture, I think the purpose was to serve the government. So he would outlaw he outlawed religion and killed people, you know, purged millions of people from um, following what they, whether we agree with the religion or not, how they were doing it. That was one of the things he did. You know, Mao did that. Lenin over in um, Russia. Yeah. You, you know, another, you know, the other, oh, Stalin, actually, Stalin. In communist Russia, as he was coming up, you know, there was a purge there. Anybody that had anything that got in the way of what he thought was the correct way to the state and the state's authority in a person's life, they died for it. Yeah. Either that or if they were lucky, they were banished to a prison. But you know, I can, those two come to the top of my mind. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and I would even argue that there are some even more subtle ways that uh, that are used to try to get people to make sure they're, they're serving the government. And it, and it may not be, you know, just one individual. I, in a lot of ways now, I, I mean, there are specific individuals, that, as, as you mentioned, some of them, and, and there are more, and there have been more. But then there are also, I think, some more subtle ways where it's not necessarily an individual, but it's an organization that's trying to force you to think like how, how they think. Um you know, we, we have in this, pastor's been having us pray for this political process because uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking anything about, you know, whether you consider yourself Democrat or whether you consider yourself Republican. I, I, that's, that's, that's not my point. The only thing I'm, I'm bringing up is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, the, you know either party will say, will say, this is the way we think, and they want you to think that way. And <laughs> they they more subtly try to try to do things or use arguments to to get you to to think in that similar type of fa- fashion. Now, uh, another another potential subtle way, and I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm I'm being unpatriotic or anything, but yesterday, uh, as I I had already prepared this section and 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 I had thought of this, but. We're walking into Audrey's, uh, my daughter's cross country meet, and pretty much right when we got to the field, a guy starts playing the Star Spangled Banner, right? And what does everybody immediately do? They stop moving, possibly take your hats off, possibly cover your heart, and then you look at a flag, right? Um, and and I, I, I get, I get the purpose of it. Again, I'm not trying to be unpatriotic and, and think of that, but I'm just saying like. You know, it, it was it, in times past. It was to the point where the the flag was considered a sacred thing, uh, the U.S. flag. And and I mean, I'm talking about the U.S., but it could be any country. Really, insert insert any country there. You hear this? You hear this, this band strike up and the music play? You've got to immediately stop it. Immediately, what you're doing, and and in some sense, in a subtle way, that's that's. A bit what what Nebuchadnezzar did. When you hear this band, you need to go and you need to bow down to 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 this golden uh, you know image. Um, but you know it, it's it's all of these all of these things, whether whether directly in your face, such as this, or or even more subtle. We we have to make sure that we keep our faith. Uh, well, we we have to make sure that that we maintain our faith, even as these boys, as these young men did, which we'll learn more about in a minute. But um, you know, a lot of it now in the U.S. it's you know keep your faith as a personal conviction, but make sure you support whatever the country does openly at all times. I even heard of a, of a uh, political figure, and I can't remember who it was, but he was. Talking about his stance on, you know, pro-life or pro-choice, you know, this whole abortion thing, and he went with the party as far as pro-choice, but he's saying in, internally he's pro-life, and we, all I'm really saying is we as Christians, we can't do that. We have to be what God tells us to be. Like, if God says this is the right way, this is the way we have to do it. We can't let 
some party, some some influence, um, you know, pull us away from what God wants us to do or to be. Um, Amen. 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 So I'll pause right there. I know uh, we kind of went off into the topic, but I just I, I wanted these were some these are some of the questions that were in the book that I thought might be relevant to talk about as we're just talking about this and imposing figure the golden idol. Anybody have anything else uh, just from this first verse or, or anything they want to share? Hey, Damien, I just wanted to share and say that I thought it was a, a, a really good call out when uh, you talked about the background, uh, just a little bit about a back, the background text about the type of God um, that they worship along with the simulation that they were trying to, to do for the Hebrew boys. And, you know, what came to mind was just, just how far um, leaders go to try to get people to turn over uh, to their way of thinking or their way of doing things, you know. And, you know, last week they tried to start with the food. Now they start tackling the faith, right? So we have the physical, now we have the spiritual. Then they, you know, once the, if the spiritual follows, then you know the mental, emotional also follows, you know, follows suit based off of your faith. And so it's very interesting that, to, that it shows exactly what Satan tries to tackle when it comes down to changing us over to his regime and, 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 and what he wants us, us to do as people. And if you're not careful, and I also like how you brought up just some, some of our, our traditions here today, if you're not careful, it could be those very small, subtle things that you end up doing without questioning, and it could be embedding itself into your life. Like you said, like with the Star Spangled Banner, um, through music, certain music, uh, uh, certain certain things that we even do here, that if you're not careful, you don't really know what it is you're singing, what it is you're listening to, what it is you're watching. Those small things could be embedding itself into your way of life in order to uh, take you away and pull you away from God. So. I just wanted to just bring that out of uh, just just how far uh, 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 Satan is is going to go when he's seeking to devour you, basically. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay. We'll go to the next section, which is called the scheming informant, and we'll read Daniel chapter three, verses eight through twelve. Uh, would someone be so kind to read those five verses for me? And you can read from whatever verse you have. I have the King James Version on the screen if you were looking at that, but whatever you have is fine. I, I can go ahead. I got the uh, new, new International Version. Okay. Okay. Um, verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Thank you. Okay, so we first saw an imposing figure in, in the gold idol. Now we see an imposing law that, that comes along with it. And the first big thing I, I really want to point out from this is I, I put down on, on the presentation, snitches come. You know, like, the, here's these three Hebrew boys. They Now, they've been placed in a certain position by this time. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar had placed them there because as we 
as we learned about through in chapter one, there was there was something special about Daniel, uh, Mishael, Hananiah, uh, and Azariah, uh, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as as they say here. There was something special about these basic, and the special thing really was that they had the spirit of God upon them, but. Nebuchadnezzar had saw it, and and not only Nebuchadnezzar, but the people who were placed over them saw it that that there was something special about the about these guys, and because of that favor of God, that that presence of God upon them, they were now elevated above you know pretty much all of their peers. So now that that kind of, I'm kind of giving a little bit of of a clue as to what I think the answer is. I have a question on here where it says, why do you think that that these people came to Nebuchadnezzar in the first place? Anybody have a thought there? Yeah, I, my thought was that, well, in my translation it says astrologers. In other ones, I think it's Chaldeans. Yes. They would have been people that were passed over for the, the positions that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. So yeah. it would have been a jealousy, I think, would have been their motive. They were jealous because in the translation it says when they were complaining, they said they, nev- they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. They didn't mention they were uh, they were angry about their, their own personal god. They were offended for the king, so to me it was they were, they were manipulating, and they may not have believed in that God either. It, it's just that they were passed over. Yeah. These Jewish boys were promoted over them, and they had, I think there was a strong jealous, jealousy involved in them bringing the complaint forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you touched on two points that uh, that I – just want to make sure everyone gets from from the reading. Um, the the first one that Deacon Harry mentioned was yes, in the in the King James version it does say Chaldeans. When you go and look up what, what that word is in the Hebrew, or actually they may have written this one in uh, uh, I believe it's Chaldee, uh, that that Babylonian language. Um, it means a, a Magian, like you might be familiar with the term Magi. The, the Magi who, who saw the star and, and navigated to Jesus you can read about in the New Testament. But it says Magi or uh, or a professional astrologer. I believe in he mentioned in the New International Version it says astrologer. So he's absolutely correct on that. Essentially, these were Babylonian priests. So they would have been in that same group of people that Daniel... Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of when they were when when Nebuchadnezzar was sitting across you know the, the the best of the best if you will and feeding them a certain diet and treating them a certain way and having them be educated in a certain way they would have been among that same group of people so yeah and Daniel was prom- promoted essentially like you know almost like second in the kingdom and then when he was promoted he then put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, he put them over three other areas. He had the power to do that. So these guys are, you know, they're the top of the top as far as this group of people go, and, and next in command to to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, essentially. So, yeah, so absolutely, I agree 100%. I think it was envy. And this, for me, was just a reminder for all of us that, when someone's promoted in in the kingdom of God, we should we should praise and not be envious. And I love Pastor said it even today. But I love what he says. We're, remember that we're in covenant. We're not in competition. We don't got to be envious and jealous of each other. That's that's just going to lead to our destruction if we do. Um, so the the next thing that you you receive from these verses is that they reiterated the king's. Uh, command word for word. You know, you, you said, King, that uh, 
when we hear, you know, all these instruments, when we hear the band strike up, we're supposed to stop what we're doing. We're supposed to kneel down to, towards this, uh, towards this golden statue, and and they're not doing it. They're not they're not worshiping your gods exactly as you said. Why do you think they made it a point to to do this to say this decree word for word? Oh, I'm turning it the wrong way. Let me, uh, let me, as you, as you're thinking about that, and perhaps someone has has a thought or an answer. But as you're thinking about that, and by the way, in this, if you, I'll be referencing verses 10 and 11 if you if you wanted to read read that. But I'm gonna jump ahead to Daniel chapter 6 verses 13 to 15. Now, uh, I'm not sure if we're gonna get to this in the Sunday school book or not. It might be a couple lessons later. Uh, I didn't look that far ahead. But anyhow, Daniel chapter 6, verse 13 to 15 says, Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Now, I've, I've, I've stopped at verse 14 for just a moment because I want to just explain something to, to make sure to get you, everyone gets the point. At this point in time, in, in chapter 6, Daniel's about to be thrown into the, to the lion's den. He, uh, this king, I believe it was Darius, made a decree that nobody was supposed to do anything uh, and, and actually, he was enticed by people who were jealous of Daniel. So we got the same thing happening all over again. So people are jealous of Daniel, and they know they can't, they can't get anything against Daniel unless they go against God, unless they do something against God. So what they put in the king's mind to do was to make a, make a statement that nobody for 30 days, I think it was, uh, I, I might be wrong on that, but I think it was 30 days, uh, could, nobody could make any petition to anyone other than the king himself. So basically, they're trying to elevate the king to, to a godlike status. Um, well, Daniel went and continued to pray to God as he should have. And now, he was highly favored by Darius. And so in verse 14, it talks about the king labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He didn't want to deliver Daniel to the lion's den. But here's, here's where we get the answer why I think they re reiterated the decree word for word. Verse 15 of chapter 6, it says, Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is, that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. I think that's why they reiterated word for word right there. What they basically said at that point in time, see, we don't have, uh, we don't, at least in the U.S., uh, other countries it can be different. But in the U.S., there's a process to get a bill passed. The, the president has certain rights they can do, but he, he can't, he or she can't, like just say this is this is the law everybody obey it and it can't be changed we don't have that but see back then they had if the king made a statement and particularly if he if he wrote it down and then sealed it which which that that occurred then that law could not be changed even the king that comes afterwards couldn't change that law so i think that's why they reiterated the decree word for word to remind him hey uh, Nebuchadnezzar, this is what you said. Now you know that you can't go against that because this is our law. You, what you said is spoken. It, it, it's almost, uh, I, I believe Pastor made a reference to it t today, that um, you know God is uh, continuing to uh, speak, and His His words are forever. Um, what, whatever he writes down, he right. He had that that talking about that writing something writing on the wall. Like you don't want that because once it's done, once God writes on the wall, it's done. It ain't changing. It's it. 
So whatever he, but so this is a similar type thing. Once they wrote it back then, it was done. It was over. So in verse twelve, we just see that you know they just as I as I symbolically say we have this they have the scene now just pouring salt into the wound. And looking looking back at verse twelve here of chapter three he says there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So after they after they reiterate the, his decree word for word, now they just pour salt in the wound because they're like, hey, not only are they not obeying, but Nebuchadnezzar, these are people that you set up. You put in that position, and they're not they're not obeying you. So they just just pouring salt into the wound. It ain't good enough to just say they're not obeying, but he has to. They have to remind him of what he did. Uh, they don't. He, they're basically saying they don't like you nor respect you. They don't worship your gods nor do they care anything that you that you really say about. So what are you going to do about it, old king? <laughs> That's basically what they're doing, just stirring the pot, pouring salt in the wound. So uh, we we have to be prepared, likewise, that people are going to say things and, and do things against us. and But we have to continue to stand. And we'll see what the response is of the three Hebrew boys in, in just a moment. But before we go to the next section, I just wanted to ask, did anybody see anything else? in those five verses or have anything else that they want to bring up or any questions? Yes, sir, Brother Minister, it, looks, it, it would appear in actuality that the king ruled with an iron fist, as per se. Mm-hmm. And so uh, when the king gave an edict, that was the law. When he made a statement, that was the law. And so there was nothing that you know, he could do to contradict himself. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and it is, as you say, and having lived overseas, that once, you know, you're in a different country, a person gives a rule or law, it doesn't, it doesn't change um, so easily. Uh, I know I've heard a whole lot of uh, rhetoric during this, uh, presidential election about democracy is at stake. And um, so phrases like that uh, can excite, and I think this is what they were doing. They were exciting the personality yeah. of the king. Uh, I mean, he, he, they were hyping him up pretty bad. I mean, he it's not like his head wasn't big enough already, but it was it was probably probably pretty blowed up by now. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, like I did I did say that, right? So <laughs> uh, but we, we do have to as Deacon say, we have to pay attention to the uh cultural as it is today. Okay. Uh, especially uh, during this political season that gets people excited uh, what they're saying, what they're doing. And so we got to be sure that we don't believe the hype. Right? We stay like Daniel. We stay to our routine of prayer. We stay to our routine of worship. Amen. We stay in the discipline of who we are as, as children of God. You know, we can be in the world and not of it. So, it, it is good to have people who believe in God in political positions because obviously the king knew in, in 6, in Daniel 6, about the favor that God had given them. All the interpretations of dreams and things of that nature, that's the reason why they got so elevated. Uh, Bible says in Proverbs, I think a man's gift maketh room for himself. So you know, God had given them and gifted them with certain wisdom and knowledge, insight, interpretations, 
and that it had, had elevated them. So it was good to have believers in positions in government. Right? It's not an evil thing. But it, you can get caught up in it if you don't manage it right. Yep. So I think uh, the Hebrew boys uh, managed it right. Uh, they didn't fall under cultural pressure, uh, economic pressure, law or passing pressure. Um, and even in today's time, what we hear, see on the radio, the preacher said, you know, those little things influence our mind over time. It's like a, it's like a, yeah, a, a water dropping on a rock. You know, it may not wear a hole right then, but over time, that, that little drip will wear a hole in it. So, yep, got to be aware, got to be attentive, we got to know that there are, uh, as my dad would say, politics is a tool of the devil. So, it's just always dividing and, and destroying. There's nothing really too good that comes out of it. But we got to have that process to have some type of governing principles. There's abuse with it. Absolutely. Yep. I, think it, I think it's really um, prophetic that this word is coming out at this particular time during this political season. I think it's, it, it, it's, it's like God is telling us something to get ready for this political this political year. So I'm I'm sticking with the principles of Daniel, sticking with God's words, you know, stand fast and, and hold tight. Amen. Amen. And that's really getting into, uh, thank, thank you for, for that. And that's, this is really getting into, I, I want to get to this next uh, part uh, before we run too short on time. Uh, but we'll go to the brave young men, so we'll see what, what, we'll see them being challenged, and then we'll see what their response is. So we'll finish off the last six verses. Would someone be so kind to read verses 13 to 18? Well, I'll read it for you, sir. Uh, this is NIV. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, It is, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image that I have set up? Oh. You hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harps, pipes, and all kinds of music. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image, I may very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? That Red Meshach Abednego replied, to the king of Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and if he, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Thank you. Thank you, Master. So we saw an imposing figure, we heard an imposing law, now we see an imposing faith. So let's let's go through this quickly. Um, What we we essentially see here, and and Minister Holmes set it up perfectly, like as as far as these Chaldeans, these astrologers, uh, the Magi, if you will, going to Nebuchadnezzar, they done blew his head up, as Minister Holmes said. And now he's in a rage. And so he's like, okay. So he's giving a, I have on the slide, second chance, and I have that in quotes. They're giving a quote-unquote second chance. Um, It's it, not really a second chance. It's just a reiteration of the first chance. Uh, that <laughs> when, you, when you hear this music, you know, you you're going to you're going to bow and if you're not going to bow you're going to be thrown into the oven i know i know what i did 
putting you into your place uh, of, of leadership or allowing you to be in your place of leadership, but I'm ready to go back on that. And, and you know that he's trying to, quote, unquote, give them a second chance because he starts out in verse 14, is it true? And I love what their response was to him. Now, there's a lot of verses here, but but I think it's I think it's I think it's pretty straightforward. This is uh, you know straightforward to understand. So I, I kind of summarize their response up, which is you know over the course of three verses, and in, just into one point, and that that is that they they made a resolute stand. They, um, it, because in verse 15, you see essentially how Nebuchadnezzar reiterated everything, and it, it's basically like a show again that attempt a show of power, a show of ego. I want I I want to show that you're under my rule. So now that I'm standing before you, be, let's see what you do. I'm going to reiterate the decree. And let's see what you end up doing. But then in verse 16, we see they, I, the New International Version has a, has a, I'd say, a better, I'd say an easier to understand interpretation, basically saying we have no need to answer you in this matter. And the King James Version says we are not careful to answer you in this model, matter. But basically, they're saying we don't really care that you're standing before us. Um, mm-hmm. Nothing's changed with what, with what, uh, with what our convictions were before you showed up. That's basically what they're saying. Now they're now they're not. The thing about it is, I don't really believe them to be doing it in a dishonoring way because they're even even though Nebuchadnezzar didn't believe like they did in the position that they were in, they were honorable. They were given honor to whom honor was was due. Which is which is biblical, you know. If 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 the president comes before me, it doesn't matter. It it matters in some respect that I don't agree with all the policies, but I'm still to honor him as as uh, as president. I can't just go up and slap him in the face because I don't like what he says, or you know, I I can't just be disrespectful because there could be something that could there could be something that happens because of that. So we're, even though we may be working with, you know, people who are non-believers, we're, the Bible says we're supposed to honor those. You know? So I don't think that they were dishonorable. I think they were just firm, though. Like, you know, nothing's changed. Like, you're before us, but we're still not bound down to your God. Um, and verse 17 goes goes further with this, saying, basically, if it's according to God's will, and I, I like that they, they, they say that, they're not just going to be, be presumptuous that, you know, God's going to deliver us from your hand. No, they said, if it's according to God's will, he'll deliver us from you and out of this burning, fiery surface, uh, burning, fiery furnace. But if he doesn't deliver us out of your hand and you put us into the furnace, uh, or well, if he doesn't deliver us out, out of your hand, you know we're still not going to bow down. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're here or not. Um, so uh, I really love their response and their resolute stand. Now, a uh, couple of cu- questions I want to ask quickly, um, with the little bit of time we have left. Why could they not? simply just bow down to appease Nebuchadnezzar, then ask God for forgiveness. Wouldn't they be breaking their commandments? I mean, the commandments of the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. Which is, um, oh, okay. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, the very first thing before God gave the Ten Commandments said, you know, you can go back in Exodus 20, verse 20, I'm sorry, chapter 20, uh, right around verse 3, basically says, uh, 2 and 3, I believe it is, um, but basically you should have no other God before me. And but, but on top of that, the reason why they also can't just 
ask God for forgiveness later. I mean, if they if if you sin, we ask God for forgiveness. But you can't. You, we we have to be careful doing presumptuous sin. Just just mm-hmm. doing something and then just oh well, God's full of forgiveness. Now we're we're supposed to be light. We can't be assimilated with the darkness if we know that it's darkness. If you ignorantly do it, that's a different story. But. And Deuteronomy 6 and 16, and this is what Jesus repeated to, to Satan when he was tempted. He said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So we can't just do and then like, oh, I'll ask forgiveness later. Not, well, there there may not be a later. You may get that, like Pastor said, you may get that writing on the wall. Right, right in the midst of you doing it, you get that writing on the wall, boom. That's it. So... Um, the the next question, and I apologize, I'm going through this fairly quick. I wanted to to get to these questions just to discuss and and have us think through a little bit, but I also want to be respectful of time. It says, what can Christians do to encourage one another to remain faithful to God and against popular opinion and social pressure? Any any thoughts on what we can do to encourage one another? <clears throat> Well, I, I believe there's many different things. These are just some of the ones that I that I put down. Uh, obviously, we can pray one one for another, with one another. We can witness, as, as Pastor talked about earlier. Every single one of us has a story. We can witness one another. Maybe maybe what someone's going through, uh, some some social pressure, whatever. We can something that we went through could relate to whatever they might be going through. We can we can do like we're doing right now, studying the word together. We we can fellowship one with another. We can remind each other other the about the promises of God. You know, if, if some something that you know, I I'll be with you always. You know, if someone's going through some sort of tra- challenge, some sort of trial. So, um, as many different things we can do. Well, I have just one last slide, and um, we'll just read through these. These are the practical points. These are in the book, but I wanted to put them onto the slide just so, you know, if somebody doesn't have the book, they can at least see what what the practical applications of of this are. (coughs) Number one says, those who seek to honor God are often falsely accused of dishonoring proud human leaders. As Christians, we got to understand that our convictions will be tested. You can read more about that in in First Peter, chapter four, verse twelve. We got to understand we're going to be tested, but but we got to continue to honor God. Number two, those who are loyal to God will stand out from the crowd. You can you can read you know a scripture for, for reference for that is Matthew chapter five, verse sixteen. We must let our light shine. We we can't be hid under. A bushel. We're, we're going to stand out. We're in, we got to understand we're in a dark world. We have to let the light of Christ shine through us. Number three, pride can drive people to hatred. Proverbs sixteen eighteen talks about how pride goes before destruction. So as, as I talked about a little bit earlier, we're not, we together are not, we should be envious one of another because we're not in competition with one another. We're in covenant. So we we got to be careful about that pride thing. Number four, God's people cannot negotiate victory on the world's terms. I like how uh, John said it in 1 John 2.16 that all the things of the world, they're not of the Father. The I think it was the lust of the eye, the pride of life, lust of the flesh, all the things that are in the world. So we... We can't use worldly terms uh, to negotiate any any for, any form of victory. We have to use God's terms. Number five, we can count on the Lord for security when the world targets us for persecution. I like, uh, and I think I use I used this in a sermon recently. Um, um, I think it was a sermon. I think it was the second sermon I did. Uh, at, at New Birth, but Psalm 24 says where it talks about how you are with me. The, I will not, I'll fear no evil because you are with me. The Lord is with us, so we can count on His security. We don't have to worry about what persecution may come because God's with us. 
and and believe me, if even if persecution is to is to our demise, you're going to be in a much better place with God than you are on this earth. So so even that that shouldn't cause us any fear. And lastly, it is better to face earthly consequences for obedience to God than to sin. And I like how Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. I'm giving you these scriptures in case someone want you know needs some further encouragement on this or wants to go back and, and you know read some of these. Um, but Matthew chapter 10 verse 28, Jesus talks about we whom talks about whom we should fear. We don't need to fear the the person that can destroy our body and can't do any more. But we're supposed to just. Be fear the one that can destroy both body and soul in hell. That's God. So we have to not worry about what the earthly consequences are as long as we're being obedient to God. And I know I went through that quickly, but like I say, I wanted to at least get these get these stated. Um, that we're at the end of the lesson. Does anybody have any other comments, any other questions or observations? Okay, I'll take the silence as we're content and we're we're ready to dismiss. So with that, let's let's go to God in prayer. Most holy, gracious Father, we thank you for this story of being resolute in a time of trial, in a time of direct persecution. We thank you for this because it encourages us to endure the trials that we have, even in this present day. Bring to remembrance your scriptures that will encourage us to continue to fight the good fight of faith. Let us be reminded to pray one for another, to witness one to another, to share of your promises one to another. And let us be able to take, let our light shine, or let your light shine through us, I should say, to, in this evil and dark world. Be with us as we go through this week. Let your love continue to carry us through the saving grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, never be forgotten. In Jesus' name we ask and pray all things. Amen. Amen.